The fact that Jesus Christ was slain, as Peter says, from the foundation of the world or the foundation of this present cosmos, world arrangement, indicates that the plan of salvation had been completely determined before the commission of the first human sin in the Garden of Eden. The word, we are told in Philippians chapter 2, was to empty himself of immortality and experience human birth and human life. Since the Most High God remained immortal, it was He who, through the Holy Spirit, impregnated Mary with a single cell which contained all that the Word had been throughout eternity. It was all condensed somehow, some way, and again, we don't have any way of trying to explain that other than that's what God did. And then through this act, of impregnating Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ, the Most High God became God the Father, and Jesus Christ, the Word of the Old Testament, became His Son, the Son of God. Now, after becoming the Son of the Most High God, the plan called for the Savior of mankind, the Savior of the world, to live a sinless life for 33 and a half years, and then die by the shedding of his blood, which he did around 3 o'clock on Wednesday afternoon, the year of the crucifixion. He would then remain dead in a state of unconsciousness for three days, after which he would be resurrected by the Father around 3 o'clock on Sabbath afternoon, exactly three days later. That would make him, at that time of being resurrected, even though he remained in the tomb until the sun went down and then he exited after three days and three nights being in the heart of the earth, okay, after that point when he came forth from the dead at around three o'clock, he became the firstborn from the dead. That is, the firstborn into immortality from the dead. There are others who had been who had died and been resurrected physically, but as far as the firstborn to immortality. That's what the point is here in Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. Here Colossians 1, 18, and from the context in the previous few verses, it says, and he, referring to Jesus, is the head of the body, the church, the body is the church. Paul elaborates on that much more in uh, uh, Corinthians. The New English Bible goes on, He is its origin. Jesus Christ is its origin. That is how the body, the, the church, came into existence. He is its origin, the first to return from the dead. The first to come forth into immortality from being dead, from being in a state of unconsciousness. Several hours after his resurrection, early on the first day of the week, as the firstborn from the dead, the Son of God ascended to his Father in heaven to be accepted as the first of the harvest of the children of God. He fulfilled the symbolism of the wave sheaf offering, as the King James calls it, the elevated omer, as the actual Hebrew would be, the elevated omer offering, which represented the presentation to God of the first cutting of the early harvest that began a harvest period. Now, the purpose of our assembly today on this 50th day from the Sunday that fell during the Days of Unleavened Bread is to focus our attention on, the, on, the, on one of the seven major steps being used by God in order to complete His plan of salvation. We come together on the Holy Days. We assemble to remind ourselves, to be reminded of God's plan, of His purpose, why we are here. The first two festival seasons, or first, first festival events of the year, are the Passover sacrifice, the Passover that we commemorate, and the Days of Unleavened Bread. And they are memorials of steps required for the accomplishment of God's plan. The shedding of the blood of the Lamb of God to atone for the sins of the world and the extension of God's grace or God's favor to those who have come under the blood of the Lamb of God. 
that means that at this stage, festival number three, at this stage in the unfolding of God's plan in the annual presentation that we have, we have two of the seven festivals that are memorials of events that have either occurred and will never occur again, such as the sacrifice of the Savior, one sacrifice and one only, as Paul brings out clearly in the book of Hebrews, and we have the days of unleavened bread that has occurred for some, but it is still in the process of occurring for others. So there are memorials of either events that have already occurred or are still in the process of occurring, and we have then five festivals still awaiting fulfillment in the future. Pentecost, also known as the Feast of Weeks in the Old Testament, celebrates the completion of God's first harvest season, which symbolically lasts a full seven weeks from the time of the first cutting of the, of the harvest season, uh, of this first harvest season. The presentation ceremony of that first cutting, the wave sheaf offering or the lifted omer offering, symbolized the appearance of the resurrected Son of God before the Father in heaven. That was what its symbolism was. Fifty days ago, you know, if it were still being offered, uh, we know that that's the time frame. So from that offering 50 days later, we come to today. This 50th day pictures the time when many more will join the wave sheaf as literal children of God. He is the firstborn from the dead, that wave sheaf, the one that was presented symbolically uh, on a uh, the, the Sunday that falls during unleavened bread. Let's turn back to Leviticus chapter 23. Take note of what God says was to occur, at least in the sacrificial system is of Israel, on this particular day in His plan and purpose. Uh, verses 10 and 11 talk about that wave sheaf or the lifted Omer offering that occurs 50 days prior to this festival. But down in verse 15, and you shall count for yourselves, okay, you are to count, you're to make a count, you are to count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath, because that's the only Sabbath he's had reference to thus far in this material in chapter 23. He talks about the Sabbath in verse 3, the only time it's used until we get later on into chapter 23. So he's specifically talking about the weekly Sabbath. All right, so from the day after the Sabbath, that is from the first day of the week is when you must begin your count. From the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave, Tanakh translates the elevation offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall offer a new grain offering, or the Revised English Bible says, then a, you are to offer a grain offering from the new crop to the Lord. Verse 17, you shall bring from your habitations two wave loaves of two-tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour. They, these two loaves, shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits to the Lord. So we are told right up front that these two loaves represent the first fruits, the totality of the first fruits, not some of the first fruits, the first fruits. Now, verse 18, and you shall offer with the bread seven lambs of the first year without blemish, one young bull and two rams. They shall be as a burnt offering to the Lord with their grain offering and their drink offerings, an offering made by fire for a sweet aroma to the Lord. Then you shall sacrifice one kid of the goats as a sin offering, and two male lambs of the first year as a sacrifice of peace offering. So we find here that blood was to be shed in offering the animal sacrifices. You cannot offer an animal, you cannot bring an offering of an animal without it being killed, and God's instruction was that it was to be slain by the shedding of blood. It's the only acceptable offering that God would allow. So blood was shed 
in offering these animals, picturing the blood of the Lamb of God, which had to be shed in order to offset the leaven used in these two loaves, because the two loaves had leaven. We saw in the days of unleavened bread that leaven represents sin. And so we have two loaves baked with leaven. Now we have animals that are sacrificed, showing again, picturing the shedding of the blood of the Lamb of God in order to atone for that sin. The peace offering that we read about here in verse 19 was, again, you could read earlier in the book of Leviticus about the peace offering, but the peace offering was always an offering of celebration. It represented a meal that was to be shared with God in the presence of God. Now, verse 20, the priest, and this references to the high priest, the priest shall wave or elevate, again from the Tanakh translation, shall elevate them, that is the sacrificed animals, they're sacrificed and then they're lifted up to be accepted as well, with the bread of the first fruits. So the bread of the first fruits is elevated, the animals, the sacrificed animals are elevated as a wave offering before the Lord, that is in his presence, with the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. Notice, they're holy, specially set aside, consecrated, and they are for, ultimately, the priest. The focus here in verse 20 is on the two loaves. They are holy to God, and they are given to the priest once they're presented to God. God must accept them first. Once he has sec uh, accepted them, designated them as acceptable to him, then they're given to the priest. However, the peace offering is also, as again we've seen here, elevated with the loaves to represent at the time of this presentation of the loaves to the priest, there will be a meal shared in the very presence of God that we know to be the marriage supper, which we were not going to get into today, but that is all inclusive of this instruction. Now, verse 21, And you shall proclaim on the same day, on this 50th day, that it is a holy convocation or a sacred assembly to you. You shall do no customary or servile, that is your normal service job or vocation. You shall do no customary work on that day. So it is like the, whole, like the seventh day of the week. It is a holy day. It's a, it is to be treated like a Sabbath. It shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. The ceremony of the elevated loaves that are pictured, that's pictured here in chapter 23 symbolized the time when the third step in God's plan will be completed. It will be completed on the 50th day. Not in the process, it will be finished, this third stage. Let's note in 1 Corinthians 15 the exact time when this event occurs. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and in verse 20. But now Christ is risen, Paul writes. Again, the question was, there are those who doubt, doubted whether he had been, and Paul is saying, but he has risen. There's no question about it. He has risen. There are witnesses, Paul being one himself of the resurrected Christ. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits, or as Moffat has here, the first to be reaped. The first to be reaped of all of the harvest, this first harvest, the first one reaped is Jesus Christ. Of those who have fallen asleep, the first to be reaped of those who have died, in other words. The New Revised Standard has died. For since it goes on, for since by man, now Jewish New Testament translates this through man. So through man came death. Through man also came the resurrection of the dead. So the first Adam, and he goes on to explain, for as an Adam, that is Adam in the Garden of Eden, as an Adam all die because of the decision to sin, disobey God was made, in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. Christ being the second Adam, as Paul designates him in other places. But each one in his own order. Okay, each one. There will be the rest who are resurrected. Christ will be made alive. 
each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, that is the first to be reaped afterward. When will the rest? Afterward, those who are Christ's at his coming. So this 50th day marks the time of his coming. This is the time when the rest will be given light. It isn't until after Christ returns that the meaning of this particular festival is accomplished. It's completed. But not until then. There's a harvest going on. God has already prepared many stalks of grain for harvest, yet he has not actually harvested any of those stalks of grain as yet. Hebrews chapter 11 tells us why. Hebrews 11, verse 39. I'll read this from the Good Speed translation. It says, Yet though they all gained God's approval. Now you go back to the beginning of chapter 11, you find Abel mentioned Enoch. You know, we have Noah, we have Moses and Aaron and Abraham, and well, not Aaron, but Abraham. Uh, we have a number of individuals that are mentioned in this chapter. Though they all gained God's approval, by their faith, that is, their, their trust in God, their belief. They, they trusted everything that God told them, that he would fulfill his promises. They believed that. They gained God's approval by that faith. They, none of them, received what he had promised. Not a one of them has yet received what was promised. For God had resolved upon uh, something still better for us, that they might not reach the fulfillment of their hopes except with us. So, they have not been harvested yet because they have to wait for the rest of the harvest. The entire harvest, first harvest, must be completed. That is, all the grain must be ready to be reaped before any of it is reaped. It's all reaped at the same time except for that first cutting. We find here that none of the first fruits have actually been harvested as yet. Some have produced fruit, some have matured, ripe and dried out, and they're all ready for harvest. They're still standing there in the field. You know, this time of year we can drive by generally, uh, different year this year, but you'll see a lot of wheat out there that's already dry. And it's standing, but you'll still see there's a little green, you know, there's some splotches here and there of still green grain still standing, green stalks, and then you have to wait. The farmers wait until it's all golden before they bring, you know, the wheat harvest, before they bring the combines in and harvest it. And so we have with God, there are those who are dried out. They're ready for harvest. That is, they've died. They know there's no life left in them at this moment in time. And again, we have Abel, Enoch, we have Abraham, Moses, Isaiah, we have John the Baptist, we have Peter, Paul, we have, again, tens of thousands of others who are already ready for that harvest. However, there are still quite a number of green plants, some with much ripening fruit already on them and some with very little fruit that still needs quite a bit of time before those particular stalks are ready for harvest. The owner of the field patiently waits until the whole crop has sufficiently ripened before harvesting his field. Let's note that here in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13 and verse 24. Here Jesus gives a parable. Another parable he put forth to them, to his disciples, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares. Tares is an old English word for weeds. Sowed weeds among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares, or the weeds, also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have these weeds, these tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? Do you want us to go and weed your field? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at 
the time of harvest. And we've just seen earlier in 1 Corinthians 15, the time of that harvest is at the coming of the Son of Man. At the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first, gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, we skip on down to verse 37. The disciples wanted Jesus to explain this to them. He answered and said, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares, the weeds, are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age. So he specifies very clearly the time this harvest will occur. And the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares or the weeds are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. He says, the Son of Man will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. It's a reference to the day of the Lord when we find that at least 29 out of 30 human beings will be killed and destroyed through the plagues that come. So, that's the time of the weeping and gnashing of teeth. It is inevitable. There is no way to stop this. This is an event that God has prophesied. That's the time element of when the harvest will occur. It says, then, once this happens, then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom. It's talking about glorified beings, those who have been resurrected from the dead, who are now immortal, who now have eternal life. They will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So Jesus tells it, now we have ears to hear. We understand that the harvest must wait until the end of this age, which ends at the time that the seventh trump is blown. On this day, which represents the time of the actual harvest of the first fruits, When that will take place, let's reflect, brethren, on exactly what it means for us and to us to be part of the first harvest of God's children. To do so, today I would like for us to examine one of the best examples of being a first fruit. And that example is the story of Joseph and what we can learn from his life and what he experienced. As we're all aware, Joseph symbolized Jesus Christ in the account found in the book of Genesis. He represented the Savior because he was a Savior. But the story of Joseph is also the story of what it's like to be a first fruit among those first called or chosen or selected by God. As a matter of fact, There are three primary lessons applicable to the first fruits that are contained within the example of the life of Joseph. The first of those lessons is that first fruits receive a special invitation or calling. They receive a special, a unique invitation, a unique calling. In John chapter 6, verse 44, we are very familiar, we've covered this particular verse so many times we've committed it to memory but John 6 44 where Jesus says no one can come to me unless the father who has sent me draws him so not just anybody not just the whole world not you know there are very select ones that the father picks out says I want that one or I want this one but he doesn't just open the door and say all who want to come come That is wrong. That is not biblical. It's not substantiated in Scripture. Jesus substantiates no one comes unless the Father's made that selection. Now, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 tells us why God selects the ones that he does to be included among the first fruits. Here in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, verse 26, the Jewish New Testament states, Paul, again, speaking to those in Corinth, but it's applicable down the line to the rest of the church of God. Just look at yourselves, brothers. Look at those whom God has called. Not many of you are wise by the world's standards. Not many wield power or boast noble birth. 
going on in verse 27, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world, that is what the world considers to be foolish, to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things, he selected the weak as the world would view it, the weak things of the world, to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world, that is, that things that are not noble as far as the world standard, and things which are despised, God has chosen. The things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Or as the Jewish New Testament says, to bring to nothing what the world, the things the world considers important. The world considers much important today that we don't consider to be important, and God certainly doesn't. And he says, why? Why does God make this? Why is it that he selects the ones that he does so that no one, verse 29, Jewish New Testament translates, so that no one should boast before God. No one can say, oh, I'm so important. You know, I'm the important one. God saw fit to get me because I can help him do his job. I'll be able. You know, other people wouldn't be able to do this, but I can do it. No, nobody goes. No one that he selects will ever be able to say, you know, God couldn't have done it without me. Now, the invitation to be included among the first fruits depends solely on God's mercy. Solely on God's mercy, not because of our qualifications whatsoever, but on God's mercy. Notice that here in Romans chapter 9. Romans 9 and in verse 6. The Jewish New Testament states, but the present condition of Israel does not mean that the word of God has failed. That is, Israel's off into the world being absorbed in the rest of the nations. This is what Paul's talking about. For not everyone from Israel, or better translated by the good speed, descended from. Okay, those who have descended from, the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not everyone descended from Israel is truly part of Israel. Because we know Israel is a name, a title that designates a certain people. The name Israel means prevailer with God. Now, the tribes of Israel are not prevailers with God today. We even have a nation over there in the Middle East, a state called Israel. And that means prevailer with God. God says it's a hypocritical nation because they are not prevailing with him. They're doing it their way. They're still using the name of Israel, and he's going to show that, nope, you know, you're not properly representing me to the world, but when I'm done with you, you will be. Okay? So not everyone that is a physical descendant of Israel is truly a prevailer with God. He goes on in verse 7, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. Again, physical descent. But in Isaac, and here he quotes from Genesis, in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. Those who are physically descended, God does not count those as children. But the children of the promise are counted as the seed or reckoned as descendants. For this Verse 9, Jewish New Testament, for this is what the promise said. At the time set, I will come and Sarah will have a son. Because Sarah was incapable of having a child. God worked a miracle so that she could. God worked a miracle so that Abraham would be able to produce an heir. Isaac was that heir. But a child of promise, not a child that could have come other than by a miracle from God. That's what he's saying. Verse 10, I'll read from the New American Standard, and not only this, but there was Rebecca also when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born and had, done not, had not done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose according to his choice might, be, might stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. It was determined before birth, before either had done anything, God says, I'm going to select the second born to be the one that will continue to carry on the promise made to Abraham and to Isaac. Jacob's going to be, not Esau. As it is written, uh, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God because he has made that selection? Certainly not, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. 
God is the one, the only one who can make the selection. I, God says, will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. It does not, the New International translates verse 16, it does not therefore depend on man's desire or effort. It's not what people want. People, oh, I want to have a relationship with God. Unless he makes the selection, unless he shows mercy, it isn't going to happen. No matter how much they want it, it isn't going to happen. It does not depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. So again, how special is this calling? Extremely, extremely unique. In fact, Paul says, again, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that only those who are chosen, those who are selected by the Father, can truly understand the purpose and the plan of God. It isn't allowed others. Others don't really understand it. Or if they hear about it, they scoff at it and ridicule it but they don't really grasp the fullness of what God's plan is. Here in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9, But as it is written, quoting from Isaiah, I has not seen or ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. It just has not. Normal people in this world, they don't get it. They don't understand it. But God has revealed them to us. That is the things that God has prepared He has revealed to us, Paul writing to the church, where the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? That unique spirit that is given only to human beings and not to animals. Dogs don't have it. Cats don't have it. Horses don't have it. None of them have that spirit. Only man has the spirit that imparts intellect so that he is able to comprehend and reason. Animals can learn how to do certain things. They are very limited on what they can learn. Nobody to this day, as far as I know, has taught their dogs and cats to wash their dishes. No, I'm not talking about licking the plates. I'm talking about getting up there and scrubbing them, you know. No, that hasn't happened. Because they are incapable of that, man is the only one with, with a mind. They have brains that can be programmed through repetition to do certain things. Maybe gorillas can do sign language, but again, it is programmed. But to sit down and reason, no, it's it's impossible. So, no man can know the things that a man knows except by the spirit of man in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. So Paul is saying in like manner, the only ones who really get it, understand God's purpose, are the ones that have his spirit going on in the Jewish New Testament in verse 12, these are the things we are talking about when we avoid the manner of speaking that human wisdom would dictate and instead use a manner of speaking taught by the Spirit by which we explain things of the Spirit to people who have the Spirit. But the natural man, that is the unspiritual, the man who does not have the Spirit of God, it has not been given to that individual, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. That is, he does not, he's not able to fully put it together. He is incapable of putting it together as it actually is. For they are foolishness to him. The things of God are foolishness to that individual, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. It requires the Spirit of God to truly discern. Today, On this particular festival, we, brethren, who have been given the ability through the Spirit of God, we can come to understand the importance of our calling. We can understand it. The world doesn't, but we can understand the purpose of that calling through this written word that God has seen fit to preserve for us. Through the pages of the Bible, this word in our possession we can come to know, as we are instructed by those individuals, of the servants of God, that God has provided the church in order to teach the church, His people, how to use this book. That's the purpose of the ministry, to help God's people understand how to use and understand and comprehend what this book says. And so we can understand. Now, the situation of understanding God's purpose and His calling and what to do That that was different in Joseph's day. He didn't have what we have today. He didn't have a Bible. Joseph was without a Bible. It wasn't until Moses came along that we have 
you know, the Torah, Genesis through Deuteronomy written, and he lived several hundred years after Joseph. So Joseph didn't have a Bible. It was a little different from him. He didn't have the examples and the teachings that we have in order to come to the understanding that he needed. In fact, his life story is part of our teaching. It's how God is helping us to understand our relationship to him. The relationship that Joseph had with him, we're to be learning. We need that same type of relationship. God communicated with Joseph in an entirely different method than he communicates with us. Out of all of Jacob's sons, and he had 12 of them, only Joseph was selected by God to receive a position of greatness. One out of 12. That's it. In Genesis chapter 37, let's turn over. We're going to spend most of our time remaining in Genesis. And I will generally be using the New International Translation, which I think flows a little bit easier than the King James here in this section. In Genesis chapter 37 and in verse 5, Joseph had a dream. Now this is after Jacob had already given Joseph a special coat, designating him basically as the patriarchal successor. He was going to be the one to inherit all of Jacob's goods and, and, and whatever. And so Joseph being the younger not the youngest, but younger than all of the other brothers except Benjamin at this particular time, Joseph was much younger than most of his brothers. And here he is, it seems, being shown quite a bit of favoritism. Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. There was already animosity and resentment because he received you know, the designation, he's going to be the inheritor of all of, his fa- of all of their father's goods. And they would then be responsible and answerable to him as long as they were still attached to the patriarchal household of Jacob. They hated him all the more with this dream. He said to them, now he relates the dream, listen to this dream I had. This is how God communicated to Joseph. Didn't have a Bible, but God came to him in dreams. Listen to this dream. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field, When suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream. And he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When his... When he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. That is, Jacob didn't forget this particular incident of what happened and what this dream was. He kept it locked away. God revealed to Joseph that his position was to be greater than that of his brothers. Just as God has revealed to us how special is the privilege he has extended to us at this time. To be included in the first resurrection. That's what he has offered to us. That's what this particular calling, this particular selection that we are a part of. That's what it means to be among that group, that first group that will enter into immortality along with Jesus Christ, the firstborn from the dead. In his youthful zeal, we find here, Joseph related his chosen status to his brothers. Now, in one sense, it was a mistake. We look at it humanly. It was a mistake for him. He should have just kept his mouth shut because this led to greater animosity and bitterness of his brothers so that eventually it it led them to attack him and betray him and sell him into slavery. But in another sense, when we understand, God no doubt egged him on to say this because it would be a witness to them in the future of God's great mercy when they eventually found salvation under the rule of Joseph. For without Joseph, they would have died out. Joseph was their Savior. 
and they didn't see it. Any more than the Jews saw their Savior when Jesus walked the earth. Same situation. Again, we don't want to get off into that realm today. All right, throughout the example of Joseph, we're shown how Joseph never lost sight of the special calling, the special selection that he had been given. He knew that God had selected him for a special position of rulership in the future. He was only 17 years old at the time these dreams came. And so it wasn't like, you know, today or tomorrow. It's in the future. I've got this incredible possible rulership that God has shown me I will have. Like Joseph, we too need to continually reflect on the fantastic privilege God has extended to us in being part of the harvest of the first fruits. Because part of what we will have in the future, being of the first fruits, as Revelation 20 verses 5 and 6 shows, is we will be given rulership as well. We will, as some of the minor prophets in Isaiah show, we will be saviors to the world. So what happened to Joseph is a type of what happens to the first fruits. Now the second lesson that we need to understand and grasp from Joseph's example is that first fruits are required to live by faith and humility. First fruits are required to live by faith and humility. Those in the later harvest will have evidence. They'll have evidence that they, that, that we today don't have. They will, they will be able to substantiate God's promises by things that they see in the world, things they know have already happened. The first harvest will have already occurred and the certainty of salvation will be all around them. Today, Christ is the only one He's the only one. And we didn't see him walking the earth, and we didn't see him after his resurrection. We have faith and believe that this book has been preserved by God, and we trust that this book is telling us the truth. And yes, Jesus Christ, by the help of the Spirit of God in us, we are convicted that he did walk this earth and that he did rise from the dead to eternal life. But, we have no evidence that a regular human being has ever done that because it hasn't happened yet. But after the first resurrection, there will be this vast number of at least 144,000 that will have been raised up. The average Joe, the average Jane, if you will, that God has selected will come up and the people in later times, in the second day of salvation through the millennium, the third day of salvation in the white throne judgment period, there's evidence that God's promise is right on target. And Jesus Christ is going to be ruling in Jerusalem. It's going to be so bright there because of His glory and brilliance that there's no night there. So the world, those who come later, they're going to be able to have a lot of substantiation with their eyes that, yes, indeed, God's promises will be fulfilled. They're biblical figures. Abraham's going to be around. Uh, you know, David, Noah. I mean, we've got this little huge repertoire of individuals mentioned in the Scripture. They're going to be alive again, again, immortal. But there will be substantiation. We, brethren, must live by faith. We must live by being confident that God will do what he says he will do. Now, Joseph knew from the dreams God had given him that his future would be fabulous. Yet the next 13 years of his life never indicated that he was going to enjoy what, again, those dreams said. First of all, he was sold into slavery by his own brothers. Notice here in verse 23 of Genesis 37. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the richly ornamented robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty. 
There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. And of course, we find here that the brothers say, okay, well, let's just sell him to the Ishmaelites rather than kill him. And so they did. They sold him. And the Ishmaelites, it says here in verse 28, took him on down into Egypt. Now, it's important to note that Joseph was sold as a slave in Egypt. We, as Paul brings out, we, brethren, have been in Egypt. This world is Egypt spiritually. And we were enslaved in this world until God drew us out. And now we have become servants and slaves of Jesus Christ and not of Egypt. But we're still here. We're still in Egypt. And Joseph was in Egypt. He was sold a slave in Egypt. In chapter 39, we'll skip over what happened with uh, Judah and his family. Chapter 39, verse 1. Now, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything, it says, Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So he, Potiphar, left in Joseph's care everything he had. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now we find here, and we'll find later in the story of Joseph, time after time, God intervened with great blessings to keep Joseph aware that he was with Joseph. He had not deserted Joseph despite what may happen to him. God says, I'm still here, Joseph. I'm still here. And so Joseph never questioned because God gave him enough blessings. Just as we know God is with us, because there's certain blessings we have. Yes, we have trials. Yes, we find that there are all kinds of things that don't go the way we think they should go, but God is still with us. We are still in the Lord, as we recently covered in Philippians. Going on here in verse 6, now Joseph was well built and handsome, and after a while his, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me, but he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he is entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Joseph was very well aware of what constituted sin. And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Joseph's faith prompted him to remain obedient to God's law. It was faith that kept him obedient. At no point in all the story we have of Joseph is he ever depicted as transgressing any of the Ten Commandments. As a type of the Messiah, Savior that he was, the record must omit any commission of sins. So even though we find Noah had problems, Abraham had problems, you know, we have other, other of the patriarchs, we, they had some problems. We have some sins that are mentioned about them. David, we got a whole, you know, drawer full of sins for David. Uh, but as far as Joseph, there just aren't any. There are none because he represented the Savior, the Messiah. In addition, since he was also a type of all first fruits. No sin could be attributed to Joseph as one who had been shown God's favor and come under the grace of God. You see, sin is not attributed to us. No sin is imputed to us because we have come under his favor and grace as we saw during the days of unleavened bread. Now, going on, skipping down here to verse, or down in verse 11, one day he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak, said, come to bed with me. Now, of course, we know the story. She, he would not, and so he took off. She grabbed part of his clothing, and then after the master, Potiphar, came home, we find that his wife 
consulted with him. She told him this story. That Hebrew slave you brought us came, in, uh, came to me to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me? He burned with anger. Now, we're not told whether that anger was against Joseph or whether the anger was against his wife. Probably against the wife. Okay? Because had it not been, had it been against Joseph, he would have died. That was, you know, had, had he done anything with this official's wife, he would have been put to death. So chances are very great he was upset with her because she brought this on and he knew what kind of woman she was. But he wasn't put to death. It says Joseph's master took him. He had to save face for his household, so he took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And so Joseph goes from slavery, which turned out to be a pretty good job because he had every, he had control of everything as of his, you know, of, of his master. He was in an incredible position. Now he goes into the dungeon. He's thrown into prison. Despite Joseph's obedience to God, he found himself again mistreated, disparaged by a lying woman, and cast into prison. You know, sometimes, you know, we're going along, we're trying to do what God wants to do, you know, we're keeping the Sabbath, we're doing this, but it seems like, whoop, what happened? You know, God, you know, I, what, what have I done to deserve this? Joseph deserved none of this, but God was working out a purpose, and God is working out a purpose for us. We're very short-sighted. Joseph didn't seem to be so short-sighted, at least from what account is preserved for us. Now, verse 20 goes on. It says, but while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Just like the household of Potiphar. Potiphar put everything in charge. You know, Joseph, you're over it all. And didn't worry about it. The warden says, okay, you're over all. I'm not going to worry about it. Again, we find, after suffering what seemed to be another setback in his life, even worse than the one before, God's blessings helped Joseph keep in mind that God was continuing to fulfill his purpose for Joseph. That purpose was ultimately to put him in a position to where his brothers would bow down to him. The sun, the moon, the stars would bow down to him. He was going to be in an incredible position of rulership. And he was being trained. In the household of Potiphar, everything's under your control. You've got to take care of everything. In prison, you've got to take care of everything. Joseph was being trained for his future role and his future position. Now, we find here in chapter 40 that the cupbearer and the baker of the Pharaoh were both thrown into prison, and then they each had dreams. And so Joseph came in, and again, they were all under his charge or jurisdiction. Let's skip down here to verse 7 of chapter 40 of Genesis. So he asked, that is, Joseph asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, why are your faces so sad today? We both had dreams, they answered, but there's no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, do, do not interpretations belong to God? Now, he didn't say to Ra. He said to God. Do they not belong to God, to the supreme being? Joseph, Joseph was not ashamed to identify himself as a servant of the Most High God. He simply wasn't. He was there in prison in Egypt among Egyptians who were worshiping all kinds of gods. But here he said, no, interpretations all belong to God. Tell me your dreams. So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream. He said to him, in my dream I saw a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, it blossomed, its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, put a cup in his hand. Uh, this is what it means, Joseph said. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. 
So Joseph gave him the interpretation. But Joseph also added, But when all goes well with you, verse 14, remember me, show me kindness, mention me to Pharaoh, get me out of this prison. For I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I've done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. Joseph was tiring. You know, he was human. Now, it's not a sin for him to do this, but he was tiring of his continuing trials. He was, you know, he, he, was, he was kind of fed up with being kicked around, and so he sought some help from the hand of man. Okay, I'm going to reach out here. Maybe these powerful men can help me. You know, now, God's with him all along. There's nobody more powerful than God, and God had not at this point rescued him, but he's, you know, he's appealing to men. Well, then we find uh, verses 16 through 19, the baker says, okay, this is my dream. Joseph said, well, too bad. You're a dead man. You know, three days, you're going to lose your head. You're going to be hanged, and the birds are going to pluck the flesh off your bones. Verse 20, now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday. Gave a feast for all his officials, lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and chief baker in the presence of his officials. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position, so that he once again put the cup into Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker, just as Joseph said to them in his interpretation. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Joseph learned here not to put his trust in the arm of flesh because man will let you down. You have got to put your confidence in God. God is the one that we must trust, not man. Verse 1, chapter 41. When two full years had passed, two full years, Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing by the Nile. Now, in the dreams, we know of the two different sets of cows. There were the fat cows, the lean cows. There were the two sets of the heads of grain. There was the very plump grains and then the very sparsely uh, kerneled stalks of grain. And, of course, Joseph was then called in, as it goes on to show, to interpret this particular dream. Because the cupbearer remembered. Oh, you know what? I forgot all about this. It's been two years. But, you know, there was this Hebrew. So he remembered something about Joseph. Not that he was in a jail. He was a Hebrew. He was able to tell us exactly what happened. And so Pharaoh said, hey, I want to see this guy. You know, bring him here. So we read in verse, uh, skip down to verse 14. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph. And he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream. No one can interpret it. But I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Joseph exhibited true humility here. Rather than attempting to try to impress Pharaoh, to receive Pharaoh's favor and be released from prison, Joseph said, look, I, I'm a servant of God, God of my fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I can't do it. I just don't have that ability. God will do it. And so he showed humility. The human way of doing it would be, oh, I've got to impress this man. I finally got a chance. Maybe I can get out of the dungeon. Maybe I can get out of prison. Maybe I can go back home. No, I can't do it. God, God will have to do it. And, of course, here we have polytheistic uh, ruler. And what do you mean, God? Well, we don't hear all of the story here, but no doubt the Pharaoh may have questioned. At any rate, Joseph then goes on to give the answer. Tells him exactly what his dreams mean. The culmination of Joseph's humility was finally, at last, the realization of what God had chosen him to do. Again, we know from what Jesus says, he who humbles himself will be exalted, and Joseph humbled himself. He humbled himself here. God is the one who's going to give you the answer, and so God did, and in the the result of this, verse 38, Genesis 41, so Pharaoh asked him, 
Can we find anyone, that is all of his court that was assembled there, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the Spirit of God, only place in Genesis where we have the Spirit of God attributed to anyone, and it's attributed to who? The one who represents and symbolizes the Messiah, Joseph. Can we find anyone like this in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Now he had been in charge of Potiphar's house. He had been in charge of the prison. Now he is in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen, put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as a second in command, and men shouted before him, Make way. Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word, Joseph, without your word, no one will lift hand or foot in all Egypt. What kind of power is that? It goes on here in verse uh, 46 to say Joseph was 30 years old when he entered into the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from Pharaoh's presence and traveled throughout Egypt. In all things we find here, Joseph gave God the credit. He never attempted at any time to take any credit for himself. Even in naming his sons, as we read later here in verses 50 through 52, he reflected on what God had done for him in the naming of his sons. He was so focused on God. Note verse 50, before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by Azanath, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, It is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. I named my firstborn son Manasseh, which means forgetting or forgetful or to forget. Why? Because God helped him to forget. That is, God helped him to forget the horrible things that had been done to him and all that he had to experience, the unfairness that he had experienced in Egypt, being lied about, being cast into prison, these things. And also, as it says here, help me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. That is, not get bitter against his brothers for their actions. He forgot. He did not hold any resentment. There was no bitterness. There was no animosity toward his brothers. God helped him to forget that, so he named his firstborn son. Thank you, Father, for helping me forget. And then, verse 52, the second son he named Ephraim. And he said, it is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. So Ephraim means fruitful, to be full of fruit. And he was called this because Joseph said, look, God has given me incredible blessings after having endured so many years of injustice, so many years of suffering, look at the blessings that God has given the most powerful man in Egypt beneath the Pharaoh. And so his sons received their names based upon his relationship with God. Like Joseph, brethren, we must approach the setbacks and hardships with the faith that God is accomplishing something very important in our lives. Yet at the same time, we must have the humility to understand that God could just as easily have selected someone other than us. It wasn't, as we saw earlier, because of any greatness on our part. God selected us because we can't make any boast. God, you couldn't do it without me. Joseph obviously could never have gotten to where he was without what God did for him, and he led him through a path that Joseph would never have ever thought of, being betrayed, sold into slavery, bought over, you know, over the household of a major Egyptian, uh, and then over the prison, a major Egyptian prison, and then finally, yes, God took him a course he never expected, and none of us have expected the course that we have gone either. Now, the third lesson 
is that first fruits must learn that righteous judgment involves mercy. Righteous judgment involves mercy. Here in chapter 42 of Genesis, verse 39, this is after the, the, the famine had hit, and now they're in the second year of the famine. Then ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain for the famine in the land of, was in the land of Canaan also. Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the one who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. But he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from? He asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, You are spies. You've come to see where our land is unprotected. Notice the first thing that came to Joseph's mind was the time when God revealed his intention of selecting Joseph for a special purpose, revealed to him in his dreams. There was no reflection on the part of Joseph about the ill treatment and betrayal of his brothers. That wasn't the first thing. What did he remember? The dreams. His, their stalks bowed down to his. This is what he remembered. Joseph exhibits righteous judgment on his brothers. He exhibits righteous judgment by mercifully overlooking the punishment they deserve. Later on, God would record in the law, in fact, you can find it uh, in Exodus 21, verse 16, that anyone who kidnaps and sells a person is to be put to death. That was the punishment. Death for kidnapping, death for taking an individual and selling that individual into slavery. Joseph did not require that. He had the power, he could have put them all to death. He didn't do that. Righteous judgment, which Joseph utilized here, involves helping others come to see themselves so that they can come to repentance for what they have done in error. This is exactly what Joseph did. Notice here in verse 19, he says, If you're honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison, while the rest of you go and take grain back for your starving households. But you must bring your youngest brother to me, so that your words may be verified, and that you may not die. This they proceeded to do. They said to one another, Surely we are being punished because of our brother. They were referring to to him, to Joseph. We're being punished for what we did to Joseph. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we wouldn't listen. That's why this distress has come upon us. Notice they started reflecting on what they had done. Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. They thought he was dead. The first step to repentance is understanding that sin demands a penalty. It demands a penalty, and certainly they were beginning to understand. You know, this is coming back on us. Your sin will find you out. There is no way you're going to hide it. It may be hidden for a while, but it's eventually going to come out. The second step after understanding that sin demands a penalty is understanding that we are individually responsible for shedding the blood of our Savior and brother, Jesus Christ. In their case, their brother and Savior, Joseph. The brothers had come to the point of acknowledging their mistreatment of Joseph, and they understood that they were guilty of his blood. They were guilty of his death. That's what they understood. Going on in verse 23, they did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. He turned away from them and began to weep. When he heard what they said, he realized that he was getting through. Now they're beginning to think. They're beginning to remember. But he turned back again and spoke to them again. 
He had Simeon taken from them and bound before their eyes. Now, tradition says that Simeon was the one who bound Joseph and threw him into the cistern, into the pit. That's what tradition says. And so this decree by Joseph was to stimulate memories of that event, of their betrayal 21 years earlier. Memories that should deepen their repentance for what they had done, for the sin that they had committed. Again, he wasn't trying to get even. He was trying to help them see themselves. Verse 25, Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain, to put each man's silver back in his sack, and to give them provisions for their journey. After this was done for them, they loaded their grain on their donkeys and left. At the place where they stopped for the night, one of them opened his sack to get feed for his donkey, and he saw his silver in the mouth of his sack. My silver has been returned, he said to his brothers. Here it is in my sack. Their hearts sank, and they turned to each other trembling and said, What is this that God has done to us? Note, Joseph helped them to focus on the seriousness of their sins. They began to sense that God was involved with what was happening to them. When the grain they took back to Canaan was almost depleted, almost a year later, the brothers returned after begging and beseeching Jacob to let them take Benjamin, they returned with Benjamin, and they received more provisions for Joseph, and they left Egypt again to go back home. But Joseph, remember, planted his special cup in Benjamin's sack, and then had the brothers stopped and searched, and then they found the cup. And then Joseph confronted them over the theft of the cup. Notice here in chapter 44, verse 16, What can we say to my Lord? Judah replied. What can we say? How can we prove our innocence? God has uncovered your servant's guilt. Your servants, that is plural. All ten of us brothers, we are guilty of sin. And God has uncovered that sin. We are now my Lord's slaves. You see, we sold our brother into slavery. It doesn't say that, but that's what he's talking about. We sinned. We sold our brother into slavery. Now we are my Lord's servants. We ourselves and the one who was found to have the cup, we and Benjamin. He's not guilty of the sin. We're the ones guilty of the sin. Judah acknowledged that God had uncovered the guilt of the ten brothers who had betrayed and sold Joseph into slavery. They had hidden behind their lie to their father for 22 years. They told him that a wild animal had killed Joseph. And they had hidden behind that and believed that he was dead, as as we saw earlier. Reuben says, you know, we've got to give account for his blood. And now it's coming back. God is stimulating their thoughts. But Joseph said, verse 17, Far be it from me to do such a thing. Only the man who was found to have the cup will become my slave. The rest of you, go back to your father in peace. Then Judah went up to him and said, Please, my Lord, let your servant speak a word to my Lord. Do not be angry with your servant. Though you're equal to Pharaoh himself, my Lord asked his servants, Do you have a father or a brother? We answered, We have an aged father, and there is a young son born to him in his old age. His brother is dead. That was Joseph. His brother's dead. And he is the only one of his mother's sons left, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, bring him down to me so I can see him for myself. And we said to my Lord, the the boy cannot leave his father. If he leaves him, his father will die. But you told your servants, unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you will not see my face again. When we went back to your servant, my father, we told him what my Lord had said. Then our father said, go back and buy a little more food. But we said, we cannot go down. Only if our youngest brother is with us will we go. We cannot see the man's face again, or or, or, the man's face unless our brother, youngest brother is with us. Your servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons, One of them went away from me, and I said, He has surely been torn to pieces, and I have not seen him since. If you take this one from me too and harm comes to him, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in misery. 
So now if the boy is not with us, when I go back to your servant, my father, and if my father, whose life is closely bound up with the boy's life, sees the boy isn't there, he will die. Your servants will bring the gray head of our father down to the grave in sorrow. Your servant guaranteed the boy's safety to my father. I said, if I do not bring him back to you, I will bear the blame before you, my father, all my life. Now then, please let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave in place of the boy and let the boy return to his, with his brothers. How can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? No, do not let me see the misery that would come upon my father. So we find Judah appealed to Joseph's mercy. His appeal revealed that the righteous judgment Joseph was dispensing with his brothers had worked. It had worked. Judah, as well as the other nine brothers, had come to the point of being willing to give their lives for their brother. They were finally willing to do something that they didn't do 22 years earlier. Verse 1, chapter 45, Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was not one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. They were dumbfounded because they thought he was dead and there he is standing in front of them. The most powerful man in Egypt under Pharaoh. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. You didn't sell me here. God sent me here. God's hand has been in this all along. For two years now, there's been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will not be plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you. Second time he said that. To preserve for you, it's for your benefit, to preserve you a remnant on earth and to save your lives. He sent me here to be a savior, to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you. It wasn't your fault. It was not you who sent me here, but God. All of this has a hand of God on it from the very beginning. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. Joseph exemplified the position of a first fruit when he extended mercy and forgiveness to his brothers because he understood what they had done was necessary to fulfill a much greater purpose that God had in mind. Like Joseph, brethren, once we attain a position of rulership with the firstborn from the dead, we will be required to make judgments on the peoples of the nations of this world. Those judgments must be righteous judgments, and to be righteous means the proper application of mercy. And Joseph gives us that example. Brethren, as the green plants standing in God's field, which have not yet fully ripened, we need to take stock of ourselves on the day of Pentecost, this feast of weeks that pictures the coming harvest of all the first fruits. Do we fully comprehend our special calling to this harvest celebration? Are we living by faith and humility as we must? Are we learning the fullness of mercy needed for judging righteously? Have we learned that? You know, are we showing that with one another? You know, if we're not, we haven't learned it yet. Are we? Have we come to that point? Once harvested, our positions will be that of kings and priests. In order to accomplish those roles, we must have mastered all three of these areas. So like our elder brother who has gone before us, let's make the most of the time that we have left in this flesh so that we can be part of those two wave loaves. Lift it up 
and accepted by the Father at the sounding of the last trump.